Hello. Um, for those of you who may be in the wrong room, this is a uh, briefing on the Combined Air Operations Center. I understand there's a uh, TRICARE medical briefing. Is that what you're wanting? And Colonel Kennett over there can give you the room number for that. Good morning. I'm Virginia Pribble, Chief of Media Relations for the Air Force. This is a single subject on the record briefing on su support to the peacekeeping forces in Bosnia through the Combined Air Operations Center in Vicenza, Italy. Colonel John Baker, uh, who, by the way, is a Brigadier General Select, is the Deputy Director of Operations, Deputy Chief of Staff, Plans and Operations Directorate for the Air Force. You should have uh, his biography in the folders that we gave you. Colonel Baker's responsibilities include developing operational policy on training, readiness, airspace management, air traffic control and landing systems, and rated management, just to mention a few of his, uh, of his duties. The Colonel will have a few opening remarks and then take your questions. Colonel Baker. That's quite a mouthful. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Looks like Bosnia Day in the Pentagon for the media. Uh, my purpose here today is to uh, bring you up to date on what I think is a good story, which is uh, NATO's Combined Air Operations Center, uh, or CAOC as we describe it, in Vincenza, Italy. Uh, we're pretty excited about how the U.S., working with our allies in NATO, have turned the CAOC into a very high-tech facility as it is today, and uh, how we're going to use that is part of what I'm going to talk about today. If everyone is ready, all I would like to do now is just talk you through a couple of slides, and then when I'm finished, I'll uh, take your questions. First, uh, I think it's important perhaps for some of you to understand uh, what a CAOC is, what it does. It is the Regional Air Component Commander's operational headquarters for planning and executing air operations. In this case, air operations over Bosnia. Uh, the Combined Forces Air Component Commander is the commander of NATO's southern region headquarters in Naples, Italy, uh, while the CAOC is located uh, at NATO's 5th Allied Tactical Air Force headquarters in Vincenza. Uh, the CAOC director and his staff translate the commander's overall strategy into daily air operations plans, commonly referred to as air tasking orders, or in NATO terminology, air tasking messages. Uh, they then control the execution of the plan, monitor its progress, make last minute changes and adjustments, and then they begin the process all over again. The objective is to make the most effective use of NATO's air assets. Next slide, please. Just a little history. The CAC is a lot different today than it was when first organized. Uh, likewise, the mission has evolved considerably from enforcing the United Nations no-fly zone mandate over Bosnia to supporting the current NATO I-4 mission. Uh, we're pretty excited about how we and our NATO allies have been able to support the commanders on the scene by merging current intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance systems with the latest computer and communica communications technology, which has allowed us to integrate large and diverse sources of information into real-time and near-real-time displays that are easy to understand for the battle staff and for commanders. Now, this is a far cry from where the CAOC began as a temporary facility in the spring of 1993 when a small NATO staff was moved to Vincenza to set it up for a deny flight. Its initial mission was uh, to provide the necessary planning, command, and control capability need to run, needed to run deny flight. Uh, when activated, it had only the minimum essential equipment necessary to support enforcement of the UN-mandated no-fly zone. Uh, by the time deliberate force got underway this past August, uh, the CAOC's capabilities were considerably enhanced through the integration of some of the latest Air Force planning tools and situation awareness systems. At the same time, NATO worked to integrate these and other new systems into an integrated network that improved the flow of information inside the CAOC. Uh, NATO also completed and moved these new systems into a new facility last June. Uh, the highly visible, very accurate, and very successful execution of NATO's deliberate force air operation that helped bring Bosnia's warring factions to the negotiation table is uh, one indication of the success we've had in creating a highly efficient combined air operations center that can quickly translate strategic objectives into military tasks. Uh, the new CAOC facility doubled in size this past December when NATO completed construction of a new addition. Uh, this was fairly fortunate timing since it occurred just as the CAOC accepted new responsibilities associated with the Dayton Accord namely an airlift coordination cell and an enlarged ground liaison element linked to the NATO land component commander in Sarajevo. Uh, commanders are now using the best technology to support the warfighters on the ground. The objective is to provide the senior I-4 land commander, his staff, and subordinate commanders with the support they need to carry out the day-to-day -day activity of supporting troops on patrol and by monitoring movement of personnel and equipment on the ground, ours and theirs, as we help the theater commander track the pr peace process timelines. 
Through the use of the latest technology, we are now able to leverage a variety of old and new systems into a fused, all-source air ground picture that provides the most comprehensive picture of the battle space we've seen. More importantly, with the latest advances in communications connectivity, the CAOC also has the ability to rapidly refocus all available surveillance and reconnaissance assets onto a specific area of interest, thereby gaining an integrated assessment of a potentially dangerous situation on the ground. Now let me turn to some specifics on how the CAOC conducts business. And I have to tell you that during my three visits to the CAOC over the last nine months, people have been amazed at the progress that's been made there. Next slide, please. For the CAOC to be effective, there needs to be what I call a system of systems, which allows the commander and his staff to command and control the area operation both vertically to support the theater commander's strategic objectives and horizontally to provide detailed guidance to the units that are going to fly the missions that support those objectives. At the same time, the CAOC needs the ability to monitor and assess the current situation in order to respond rapidly to changes in the weather, new threats that pop up or short notice high priority missions. As this slide shows, the system uh, works continuously as the CAOC staff is simultaneously planning tomorrow's missions while executing today's. The systems in use at the CAOC on the planning side, which is what the first two bullets talk about up there, include some of the latest computer-based planning tools available to include the JFAC planning tool, or JPT as we refer to it, and the Contingency Theater Automated Planning System, or CTAPS, which you may have heard of earlier. Next slide, please. The, uh, the JPT is a high-speed multifunction system that allows the CAOC planners to link NATO objectives, military objectives, and air power objectives to specific air power tasks. The system also allows the planner access to a number of databases that contain specific information on the threat and the latest intelligence information available. Once done, the planner can then begin to determine what assets would be needed to accomplish those tasks in the time uh, requested. Uh, this product will then provide the air operations planner with an initial look at resources available versus tasks assigned. This information can then be passed on to the next step in the planning process where the CAOC uses CTAP's capability to prepare the daily integrated air operation plan or the air tasking message. Next slide, please. CTAPS uh, is a new system that allows the CAOC planners to go to the last planning level, if you will. The system can access the latest information from supporting units on their ability to support operations over the next 24 to 48 hours. Using the up-to-date data, the uh, CAOC uh, air tasking message planner begins to lay out the specific details of each mission, such as time, number, type of aircraft, what support assets are needed like AWACS and so forth. To aid in this effort, the system contains several embedded modules which give the CAOC staff and the units in the field access to email, imagery on file, and the latest intelligence updates as the plan comes together during the day. There are also programs which provide the latest weather data and that assist in ensuring airspace deconfliction, which is central to the planning process for any large air operation. But as with any system, uh, if you can't effectively communicate the data to your forces uh, while watching the threat to those same forces, you can't execute it very well. This is where C4ISR, and this is a mouthful, command, control, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance becomes central to the execution of any plan. Next slide. Okay. Uh, at the CAOC, NATO, joint, and commercial systems tie all the elements of the mission together by capitalizing on existing processing capabilities both in Europe and in the U.S. Theater support comes from a full-service network in place today to support I-4 commanders. The support runs the gamut from allowing an I-4 patrol on duty to call for help to allowing the CAOC to redirect a fighter mission or an airborne sensor platform to a higher priority mission. The high ground of space provides the CAOC access to satellite communications and surveillance systems that allows the CAOC to rapidly forward information to the right place at the right time, which allows the affected warfighter to get inside the decision cycle of his opponent. Use of the high ground gives the warfighter unprecedented situational awareness and allows decision making based on a much truer real-time picture of the battle space, which is becoming more important as time goes by. Lethal flexibility involves the planning and execution aspect of CAOC operations. It includes building the NATO air tasking message with our CTAP system, controlling airlift in and out of the theater, and fusing all source information for targeting purposes, while simultaneously having the connectivity to rapidly retask and reorient airborne assets to support a developing situation on the ground. C4ISR systems supporting the CAOC and I-4 provide a superb capability to place lethal air power and a variety of surveillance and reconnaissance sensors any place in the Balkan theater at any time. Next slide, please. 
you know, I don't have the time to talk about all the C4ISR IS, systems that we have out there or are using out there on a day-to-day -day basis, but I would like to pick out a couple. You know, I think you're already familiar with how the U-2 operates, uh, how NATO's Airborne Early Warning Radar Aircraft operates, and the power scene system which the air crews are using to practice their missions over Bosnia. I would like to briefly address uh, these two systems, however. Uh, the commanders and the CAOC staff have worked hard to fully integrate these and other systems into the overall concept operations for NATO's mission in Bosnia. They have found that these systems' ability to provide them with real-time visual and radar monitoring of the situation on the ground gives them a tremendous advantage. And in the present environment, allows, allows the I-4 commander to ass assess the warring faction's progress in meeting certain timelines set out in the Dayton Accord. Uh, the reason these two systems are important is that they provide extended loiter time and can provide visual in the case of Predator and radar in the case of Joint Stars monitoring of the situation. Furthermore, by having real-time connectivity to these systems and to the forces on the ground in Bosnia, they can be rapidly retasked to look at a new area of interest. Next slide. Again, this is only to, to represent what really goes on out there, but I think it's important to get the message that the CAOC serves as a high-tech, real-time integrator of information for the warfighter coming from a variety of sources, as this slide shows. And this is only some of the major feeds. But I think it's important to give you some idea of the size and scope of the operation and how wide the information net has become. As the mission has evolved from enforcing a no-fly zone to supporting NATO forces on the ground, the ability to rapidly access, access, integrate, and distribute time-sensitive information gives today's commanders, what commanders have always desired, the ability to see over the next hill. The CAOC's successful use of air power during deliberate force was due in large part to this ability. This capability lends itself to the current mission as well as the commander and staff use air power in support of I-4. This next system I'm going to talk about is the one that gives the CAOC and other headquarters the ability to see an integrated picture of the situation over that next hill. Next slide. This is a system that's been to, uh, deployed to the CAOC to act as the central integrator of information, and we refer to it as JSAS, or the JFAC Situation Awareness System. This really acts as the eyes and ears of the commander. It not only integrates radar information from airborne and ground radar sites, but from a large variety of NATO and U.S. systems. This ability to integrate data rapidly and display it, and display it on the wall of the battle staff office space in the CAOC, it's about six feet by six feet on the wall, by the way, gives commanders a real-time picture of what friendly and threat airborne forces are doing over Bosnia. The system also has embedded in it the ability to integrate inputs from friendly ground forces and from systems that can t detect ground threats. Uh, the system uh, has access to a number of databases which include imagery and intelligence information on file as it comes on file. Depending on the headquarters staff request, the system, system is flexible enough to display live video feeds from UAVs like Predator. As currently structured, the system can display maps that are already being used by our ground forces in Bosnia to sh show deployment not only of NATO forces, but also the deployment of the previous warring factions as they were when the accord was signed. When overlaid with real-time data, the display provides the users a very clear picture of what the ground forces are doing. The bottom line is that the CAOC has been equipped with systems that give commanders the most comprehensive view of the battle space that modern technology can provide. The integration and display of this real-time view of the battle space over Bosnia gives our forces great leverage over any opposition. There are obviously no guarantees, uh, but we're very excited about what NATO and the U.S. has accomplished, and that's all I have. Sorry I went so fast. Uh, I'll take any of your questions. Does, does the JSAS able to integrate imagery from uh, national technical systems in space, or is only to integrate satellite imagery from SPOT and Landsat? Uh, I'm not the expert on that. A particular issue. I know that there are, it has capabilities beyond those, but what they are, I can't give you the specific details. To what extent uh, is this information that is received there in Vicenza being shared with the Russian component on the ground? Well, we have a very collaborative effort, and that's obviously something that we're working very hard to do. The Russians do have people in the CAOC, but their primary job in the CAOC is to work the airlift uh, flow in and out of Tuzla. Uh, and that's the only Russian presence at the CAOC at this present time. But there are Russian troops on the ground in, uh, in Bosnia, and to, so to what extent is this information being shared with their commanders? Well, the, uh, as far as I know right now, within, within the NATO structure in Sarajevo, the land component commander is in charge of uh, making a collaborative issuance of intelligence information, and the U.S. sector where the Russians are are getting that information from the U.S. division. Now, how that's physically provided, I don't know the details. We could, we could look into it for you, but I honestly don't know the answer.
Is this the first time that the Russians have been, uh, we've shared this kind of information with the Russians? I honestly don't know. I would, I would think probably it is, but I don't know the answer. I couldn't, I couldn't give you any good data can, on that. Can you describe how the, uh, the UAVs and the JSTARs uh, might be used in their role of monitoring compliance of the uh, peace agreement? Well, if there's a particular area, for instance, uh, an example might be if there's an observation post on the ground that, that sees activity in an area where there's supposed to be the zone of separation that everybody's worried about uh, that he doesn't think should be there. There's movement of forces either in and out. Uh, you have the ability to move those sensors in place to actually look at that uh, day or night. Uh, so you can monitor the movement of those forces as they flow in and out of that particular area. What does the, uh, could you tell us, like, what, what is how would a UAV be able to help you? What would it tell you as opposed to what, say, a JSTAR plane would be able to tell you about whether it's forces or weapons or something in the zone of separation? Well, I think the only difference primarily that Joint Stars, of course, as you know, is the radar picture only. So it can tell you that something's out there. Uh, the UAV, if it has an EO package on, which can give you a live TV picture, obviously that allows you to then uh, actually see the, uh, whatever it is on the ground. Of course, you have to have the weather for that. But uh, if you have the weather for it, then it can provide you that capability. And what's interesting about the CAOC, uh, with the connectivity we have right now, is uh, if a report comes in from the field, says, hey, there's activity over here, we want to go look at it, or get evidence of it, or take a picture of it, uh, by having the connectivity available, we can move those sensors in place to do that. Because they may, they may be someplace else when the report comes in. We may have to move them 100 miles or so to go and actually look at it, the problem. This isn't the same as the Gulf War, which is a much bigger theater and a different kind of theater, but could you compare what kind of uh, clarity you have of the battlefield, as it were, uh, today compared to five years ago when you were sort of, you know, the, how has the technology improved? How much more can you see? What better vision can you give commanders today? I think there's two parts to that. I think one of them is the predictive nature, that we know more about the systems that we have available out there, so the guy who's making the plan, if you will, the day prior, he knows more about what systems are out there, what their capabilities are, so he can better integrate them into the overall plan, if you will, so we can make better and more efficient use of those assets. Uh, the second part of it is I don't think anybody would deny that uh, we have a much better, clearer picture uh, for two reasons. One, it is smaller, uh, so with fewer assets we can get a better picture uh, for longer periods of time. But I think the technology that allows us to integrate that, particularly with uh, JSAS, so that you can see uh, on a six foot by six foot screen in the CAOC a live feed that fuses information from the NATO uh, airborne warning aircraft, from the ground radar sites, from the, uh, from the Air Force's MCE deployable radar system into one picture, uh, it's, uh, it's very useful. Is there anything comparable to that one picture during the, uh, during the Persian Gulf War? Not that I know of. Anybody know? Was there anything comparable? I don't think there was. They had you know, charts posted up on tents or something. A lot of charts. That's correct. Yes? Uh, kind of a two-part question. Um, how much of the air assets that the, the CAOC is responsible for U.S. and how much are, you know, belong to other countries? And I guess the second part of that, too, is how large is the challenge of, of deconflicting all these things? Well, the, the air operation is a combined operation, so there's not a U.S. operation or another operation. It's all all NATO flies together. It's a single operation. What portion of that is U.S. assets? Well, what, what percentage? Well, I think there's uh, there are eight countries that have assets flying actively on a day-to-day -day basis over there. Uh, what percentage of those are U.S. versus uh, other NATO countries? It changes on a day-to-day -day basis, so I couldn't give you a percentage that that uh, is accurate because it changes from day to day. And the, the second part was how large of a challenge is to deconflict all of those? Actually, it's, it's not as hard as it used to be. Uh, part of the reason it's not is because of some of these systems that we have over that. CTAPS has got a program embedded in it for airspace deconfliction. So as you're going through as a planner and trying to determine where you want various missions to fly, where you want your sensors to orbit, where you want the tanks to be positioned, as you add missions to that program, and provide the profile information, in other words, the route of flight and so forth. If you have one that deconflicts with one that you've already planned, the computer will tell you that and won't allow you to, uh, to run two flights together or double up in a particular orbit. And when you have a large operation, that's, uh, that's very important. Yes, go ahead. Uh, in the absence of the Predator until it's redeployed in the spring, is there any other way you can get live pictures close up from the, up from the Sort of separation, for example. In the, the only military. live pictures I know that we're getting right now because of the weather are radar pictures, and that's joint stars. 
Um, as far as live video, TV pictures wise, the weather pretty much inhibits everything that we have. So as far as I know, the only thing that we're getting live right now is joint stars. Yep. In terms of threats to uh, NATO aircraft, the primary concern for a long time have been these mobile uh, <coughs> CERB uh, anti-aircraft missiles. And do you have any better idea today of the locations of, uh, of all these missiles? Uh, I don't know the answer. I honestly don't know. I've heard people talk about what they're doing to keep track of them, but we'd have to take that question. I, I honestly can't give you an answer. Let me ask you another question. Have, there, have uh, NATO aircraft been painted in, in the last um, 30 days or so since the signing of the peace agreement by um, Serb uh, radar? Um, I, hmm. I'd like to give you the absolute correct answer on that. And, uh, and since I don't know the absolute correct answer, we can, we can probably find out for you from somebody. But I, I can't give you with any level of fidelity. We'll have to go to the theater to get that information. Yeah. What makes Predator grounded in the winter? I mean, why, why can't you fly it now? Well, the system that was over there before, as you'll recall, was, uh, was, a, uh, was a prototype, if you will. And so when it came back, one of the reasons it came back was to get some modifications to it uh, so that uh, it could see through the weather, uh, different kinds of uh, sensor packages and so forth. So it was brought back to have an upgrade, one of the reasons. So basically it's not ready now. No, but it, it uh, and I don't know the specifics. I, we can find out for you. Somebody probably knows that answer, but I don't know when it's going to be ready. I, I don't track it that closely. Sorry. Colonel Baker, uh, some of the things was concerns flying in the weather. They're putting pedal heat on it and giving it an ice detection capability because that was one of the shortcomings because it flies at the altitudes where weather is a factor. So some of the modifications besides the centers also give it some kind of capability to fly through the weather. It's icing you're worried about? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, you described this whole systems of systems as an effective prototype. I was wondering if you could um, think of any particular areas of that system that you would like to see improved or that perhaps isn't working quite optimally right now. Well, I think what's happening right now, I think it is working as well as we can make it work, and it's working remarkably well compared to what we thought it would uh, maybe a year ago. Uh, I think where the focus is going to be now is as we move more into uh, the, the mission on the ground in Bosnia is look at ways to, to integrate more information on the ground disposition than we currently have. And I think if there's going to be any additions to what we currently do, it's to get uh, a better fidelity of uh, the ground situation. Can you think of ways in which you might do that? I'm not a I'm not a technician. I mean, I don't I'm not a technical kind of guy. But uh, we have people who could probably get you some information on that. But there are systems that the that the various armies have over there, the British, the French, and the U.S. for uh, building databases. And uh, what we need to be able to do is get that information uh, fused into this system that we're talking about. And there are people working on that now. How much of a concern in a place like this is are things like network security and and. That, that's always of a concern. Uh, I think the advantage of where the CACs locate is it's inside uh, the fence, if you will, of an Italian air base in Vincenza. Uh, there's been a NATO facility there for a long number of years. And so when the CAC was, was, was built there, uh, because there wasn't a CAC at the time the uh, denied flight started, and they, they sort of embedded it into the 5 ATAF headquarters until NATO built this new building. Uh, they were in a secure area to begin with, and uh, and they've they've... Uh, taken security very seriously. NATO always has. Now, the specifics of what they've done, sorry, I, I can't help you. So you wouldn't know either about if they want to make it better or anything like that either? Uh, well, I'm sure you can always make it better, but I, no, I can't give you a, an answer. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Are, are there any, is there anything underway to make sure that, that the CAC isn't uh, susceptible, I guess, to sabotage? Not Not physically, but Oh, electronically, perhaps? Right, you mentioned it was behind a fence. I mean, like, yeah. not, not physically, but... Uh... Again, you're stressing the limit of my knowledge there. Um, <laughs> I don't know, we may be able to track something down for you, but I know physical security is, uh, is not a big issue because of where it's located. Can you talk a little bit about the additional enhancements that just happened last month, I guess, in December 1995, you have it down as a point? Yeah, uh, what, what happened was uh, when, uh, when we realized that Dayton was going to require the movement of ground forces in there, it just so happened that NATO had already started construction of, a, of an addition to the facility they had just opened in June. What this allowed us to do is uh, prioritize the space inside that new addition uh, because the airlift mission became very important. 
uh, as well as in, in, a, a considerable enlargement to the ground liaison element, if you will, because we needed to have a lot more people in the CAOC who would be able to help the CAOC understand as they plan missions for the future in terms of where the priorities ought to be and to interface with the Land Force Commander in Sarajevo. So that new addition allowed us to enhance the, the office space to put all the people in the, in the same room, if you will. I, I think you can appreciate the fact that if you have uh, a staff of 100 people and they're scattered in three different buildings, you can't be very effective in uh, fast-paced uh, operations. So now they've got them all in, in basically the same facility, which is a big advantage. Yeah. The theater now seems to be very well integrated and commanders pretty much vertically and horizontally know what's going on. How much of that information is replicated back here in Washington, either in the White House Situation Room or in the Air Force Command Center or in the National Military Command Center? Well, I don't think that the, this specific system is replicated in too many places because it's, there's only a couple of them in existence right now. Uh, the various feeds that go into JSAFs are available at various locations. So, but, but that was the problem we were experiencing earlier we tried to get away with. I mean, if you went into the CAOC uh, two years ago, uh, a lot of this information was available, but it was in different rooms and on different displays, uh, came through a different source. Uh, and what this allows us to do is integrate it in one place so that the battle staff can all be in the same room and get all the data they want uh, off of one, uh, like I said, about a six foot by six foot display. Uh, there are a lot of people who would like this system. There's a lot of effort, I guess, in place to try to get more of these things built. Is that right? But I don't know what the timelines are. Yep. Is it possible for planners of the Pentagon to be watching the same information here <laughs> as they can see over there in a live mode? Uh, I guess there are parts of it that are available. Yes, uh, <clears throat> a lot of the feeds are um, uh, satellite network feeds, uh, uh, and on that information, it can be received here as well as in theater. For those feeds that are coming from uh, a lot of the airborne platforms, uh, which are not relayed by satellite, there are organic resources available only to the commander locally in the theater. Uh, AWACS is a good example of that. Uh, that's not on satellite, that's a direct uh, uh, line of sight feed in theater. Uh, and moving that picture, the AWACS picture information around is uh, under the theater commander's control. It's not available outside of there. So there are systems like that, but a good percentage of the information that they have is also available here and uh, displayable in this mode. Does that answer your question? Yes. Um, I understand that in a joint command and control exercise last September, the Air Force was having some difficulties passing some of the information to the other service command and control centers because, as I understand it, you were using different communications protocols. Is that still an issue or has that been? If it is, I'm not aware of it, at least in the CAC. The last couple of times I was over there, I mean, you have to understand the CAC is not only combined but joint. So there are liaison elements there and actually people working in the CAC uh, from all the services and from all the countries that have assets involved in the operation. And uh, the, uh, the ATM, for example, which has always been a hang up in certain locations of how fast it gets out and so forth, not a problem. Can you, uh, can you describe it all if, uh, if improvements at the CAOC have been, I understand that there have been improvements to Im improve the amount of time it takes to get critical intelligence to, uh, to pilots, for instance, so that there's not a repeat of the uh, incident like uh, Scott O'Grady's shoot down where he missed getting a warning by you know, about a minute or so. Uh, what's been done to prevent a repeat of that? Well, again, I, I hate to keep beating this system in the ground, but, but by having all the information integrated, the, the battle staff doesn't have to depend upon someone else uh, in the facility or in another room or somewhere else uh, to pass that information along. I think the other thing that's important, too, is that uh, there's been a lot of effort in improving uh, communications from the CAOC into the theater itself so that uh, if there was a, a real serious situation that uh, we need to get time sensitive information out, uh, there are more than two or three ways uh, to get that information passed. Was all this in place when Scott O'Grady was shut down or has it been modified? It was, it was in work. In other words, as part of uh, NATO started building their new facility back in May, uh, it opened uh, toward the end of June. And some of these systems uh, were under development and uh, were in preparation for being installed, but were not yet installed, waiting on the new facility to be, to be built. So what difference would it have made uh, in this case? Well, I think it would have given us uh, a more timely view of what was going on. I, I can't speculate. I mean, there's, there's never a guarantee, uh, so it would be sheer speculation on my part. 
How will well, the, it should have helped. How will the nature <laughs> of air operations change as you move from uh, deny flight and to a mature uh, joint endeavor operation on the ground? How will the air operation change? Well, I think the focus is going to shift from, well, I can't talk for the theater. I mean, I, I really can't. I mean, I can speculate, but again, I'm, I'm, I can't talk for the theater. Uh, I would just surmise that probably the focus is going to shift over to making sure they, they prioritize the uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets to ensure that we're monitoring the situation on the ground uh, in accordance with the priorities set by the commander, by the theater commander and the land component commander in Sarajevo. But to get down to any level of detail, uh, I'd have to talk to somebody over there because that's way outside my box. Colonel has time for one more question. I just wanted to follow up real fast on when you said you had an effort to get more of these built. Do you have any idea where you'd want to put? We can get there. I know who can answer that question, but I'll have to get it for you if that's okay. Somebody uh, there's a, uh, uh, several contractors involved, uh, Autometric Incorporated, uh, BTG Incorporated, uh, Mnemonics uh, Incorporated, and uh, some assistance from uh, uh, Aegis Corporation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Cost? cost of this? Uh, we'll have to get it for you. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Sorry. <laughs>